I will start by asking Bev to please join me on stage. Bev will be moderating the session, as I said. Bev is the president of Veritas, a leading multifaceted PR, government relations, and social media agency based in Canada and the US. Aside from being an incredible business leader and one of the earlier creators of Girls 20 Summit, I'm very proud to call Bev one of my mentors. So Bev, thank you very much for moderating today's session. Speaking on the issue of child marriage, we are joined today by Mabel Van Orange. CEO of The Elders. Mabel has a knack for creating a space where she pushes forward issues that others won't champion. And I recall very fondly a lunch that I had with Mabel last year when we were both in New York for the CGI meetings. We sat down, we had a conversation, we talked about how do we move this issue forward and within one year this woman has put this issue on the global stage, has pulled together a coalition of people working with her. And I, I believe Mabel has been uh, one of the biggest forces behind Girls Not Brides. So Mabel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Jasvinda Sangara is here with us today to share her story as a survivor of forced marriage. I first heard Jasvinda's story when we met in Ethiopia as a result of Mabel's bringing together over 100 different organizations working together to eradicate child marriage. And I heard Jasvinder's story, and I knew at that moment that Jasvinder, we would want you to come here and tell your story again and to help us understand uh, the issue, but also how do we help to eradicate forced marriage. So thank you so much for being here with us today. I also should have mentioned that Jasvinder is a, uh, an author. She has an amazing book, and she also is the co-founder of Karma Nirvana, and she will tell us a lot more about that today. Speaking on the issue of human trafficking, we're pleased to have with us Tony Sheena, who heads up the Intergovernmental Child Cyber Control Organization. For once in my life, I'm really happy there's an acronym. It's IC3O. <laughs> IC3O is a not-for-profit organization focused on combating human trafficking on the internet. Uh, Tony, you were introduced to me by Belinda, who said, you've got to meet this guy. He has uh, amazing ideas about how we deal with human trafficking, and we're thrilled to have you here today. So with that, Bev, I will hold, uh, hand over the stage to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, delegates. Thank you, Farah, and welcome, panelists. This is a very, very important issue, and one that's both disturbing and, frankly, terrifying, I think, for a lot of people. And the uh, two themes, as Farah mentioned, that we're going to talk about today are child marriage and child trafficking. And there are some commonalities there, obviously, both of them being the fact that it's about preying on the uh, world's most vulnerable. And, uh, you know, the other thing that I find quite disturbing and, and scary is that it's not just about uh, issues and crises that happen far away from where we live. I think uh, for many of us in this room, it'll be surprising to know that these things actually happen in our own backyards. And so I welcome the panelists. And I'd like to start with Jez Vinder because I think it's important uh, to give this some real context. Uh, Jasvinder's story is a personal one, and uh, I don't think it really, I think Farah actually introduced it uh, quite appropriately. I don't think I have anything to add to that, so I just ask you please, Jasvinder, to tell us your story. Okay. Um, I hope you can hear me. Good morning. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying this, and I think people are quite often shocked when I make the point that I was born in England and raised in England, where you would think that all girls have a right to an education. You know, there are not the, the parallel issues of poverty as you would look around the world. Well, I was born in the UK, I'm one of seven sisters, and I watched the majority of my sisters being taken out of British schools when they were 15 years old to marry men they had only ever met in photographs. My father came from India, from the rural Punjab. My sisters would be taken out of school, taken to India, to Punjab, and then forced to marry at 15 years old. One of my sisters, Rabina, had missed almost nine months of her education. She came back to school and was put back in my year at school because she'd missed so much school. Then they would disappear and become the dutiful wife and the daughter-in-law to their husband. I was 14 years old when I was presented with the photograph of the man I was to learn, I was promised to, when I was eight years old. And here I was, a girl in school in England, and I understood you don't speak outside of your family. 
because you don't dishonor your family. You learn very quickly that honor is a code of conduct that you have to ascribe to. And girls all over the world would understand that. So it was no different for me being in the UK. I protested. I made the point to my family that I wanted an education. I just wanted to finish my education, get my GCSEs, and hopefully go to college, or dare I say university. And I say dare I say, because we were not allowed to have aspirations. My family took me out of school when I was 15 because I protested that much. I was held a prisoner in my own home for a number of weeks until I agreed to the marriage. In the end, I said yes to buy back my freedom, and I ran away from home when I was almost 16, so I wasn't even 16. I ran away from home to make the point that I was not marrying a stranger, that I wanted to finish school. That's all I wanted to do. So I rang my family, and they made the point to me, you either marry who we say, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. That, for my family, was a choice that I had to make. I never went back home, and subsequently I've been disowned for 29 years. And I became a campaigner in 1993, because my sister Rubina, sadly, who was taken out of school, and she's the one who missed nine months of her education, and nobody asked where she was. My sister was 24 years old when she set herself on fire and committed suicide and died. And to this day, my family still have a view that it was more honorable for my sister to commit suicide than to leave her husband. So I'm one person who affected and I continue to speak out against the silences. And I'm pleased to be here to be part of breaking the silence with you all today. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very powerful story, and I'm sure that will prompt a number of questions from our delegates and those in the room. I'd like to talk to Mabel now for a moment and, and ask Mabel, first of all, to give us some context about the elders. I think that it's important for people to understand who that group is, who you work for. And uh, also tell us a little bit about how and why the elders selected child marriage as a very important issue for, for them. And then maybe give us some context for why do parents do this to their children? What really is the reason for this? And I think, you know, off of what Jez Vinder's saying, uh, it would be important to get a little more context for why this is happening around the world. And all that in two minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me say a few words about the elders. Um, it's an organization that was brought together by Nelson Mandela four years ago on his 89th birthday. And the concept in a way is very simple. I, I think you all know how in traditional communities, in villages, you have, have in many cases elders who are the wise men, sometimes also women, who, um, who basically look after the well-being of that community. And what Nelson Mandela had was the vision that the world has become like a global village because of globalization, because of information technology, and yet we don't have global elders who look after the well-being of that global village. So he, together with Archbishop Tutu, who is the chairman of the elders, and Grasa Machel, um, who's Nelson Mandela's wife, but who is also a an, big an uh, fighter for the rights of women and girls, they brought together a group of 10 individuals who all used to be presidents, prime ministers, you know, the head of the United Nations, but who share the fact that they are now retired. So in a way, they become free to really speak their mind. They don't need to get reelected. They don't need to get reappointed. And so all the wisdom that they have inquired, acquired during their, their lives can now be used in order to help make the world a better place. Now, Nelson Mandela gave them an incredibly ambitious agenda. He basically said, go and bring peace where there's war. Go and speak out on behalf of, the, of those whose voices normally don't get heard. Go promote justice when injustice is happening. And so, so the, the very interesting challenge that this group of people like Jimmy Carter, Kofi Annan, uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, the first democratic president of Brazil, uh, Gro Brundtland, the first female prime minister of Norway. I mean, the, the list of 10 is in the booklets that, that I left. The, the challenge they have in a way is, is how can they as a team work together to do things that might otherwise not happen? 
And, and as you can imagine, there's so many conflicts that, that deserve attention. There's so many issues that deserve the attention. But they're constantly looking at where can we add a value that very few others can. And, and apart from some of the issues of peace and security that we are working on, and which, which I won't talk about here, um, they decided to work on the issue of girls and women. Because all 10 of them, the women and the men, feel very strongly that the, perpetu the continuing inequality between men and women and girls and boys is absolutely unacceptable. We're more than 60 years after the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, which clearly stated that we're all equal, and yet everywhere in the world, including in the West, we're not equal. Now, what they decided then to tackle is something which is quite sensitive, but, but because of who they are, they felt that's an area they could, could go into, and that's the fact that religion and tradition are often, as we all know, forces for good. Yet, at the same time, there are still too many instances where either religion or tradition are being used or misused to justify discrimination against girls and women. And when the elders spoke out about that, it had quite a bit of resonance. People saying, look, thank you so much for saying this. It's true. I can't say it, but because you have spoken out, I can now refer to what you've said. So the elders realized they were on, onto something. But we also realized, you know, general statements and things that are quite abstract don't change the world. And, and that's, you know, all of you are change makers in a way. That's an important lesson to keep in the back of your mind. You need to then do something slightly more concrete. And that's when we came across this issue of child marriage. And I have to say, many of the elders, you know, they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s, had, just like me, no clue about the size and the impact of this practice. I mean, I'm sure that everybody in this room had heard about the issue of child marriage before today. But, but I suspect that many of you, like, like the elders, like me, had no clue that we're talking about 10 million girls every year getting married. That means today, 27,000 girls are getting married under the age of 18. Tomorrow, another 27,000 girls and that it has such an enormous impact on development. I mean, we keep talking about the Millennium Development Goals and how we want to reach each of those Millennium Development Goals by the year 2015. Yet that's an illusion if we're not willing to accept that there are very young girls who are never allowed to go to school or who are pulled out of school as soon as they get married. I mean, I've been in, in various places now meeting these girls. I mean, I've see, met girls who were like six years old, eight years old when they got married. And then, of course, because they have no education, the prospects for them to make economic contributions in their lives to their families and to their community immediately diminish completely. So their main value becomes their fertility. And you then see that these girls are often forced to, have, to show that fertility at a very young age and also to have many babies. That brings us then to another Millennium Development Goal. You know, how can we ever end maternal mortality and, and improve maternal health if 12-year-old girls are forced to, to give birth? And so it's no surprise that the chances that you, that you get injured or that you die in childbirth if you're 15 years or younger are much higher, five times higher, than if you're 20 or older when you have your first baby. The children of these child brides are 60% more likely to die in the first year of their lives. The chances that these girls become infected with HIV AIDS are much bigger because their husbands, like Jess Finder described, are often men they don't know. Very often they're, they're much older, twice their age, sometimes three times their age. And these men, I'm sorry to say it, have been around. So they bring all kinds of infectious diseases into the family. And these girls at the age of 16 cannot argue for safe sex. Um, so you see that, that this practice is, is helping or is actually undermining the good work that, we're, that we, the world, are trying to do on the Millennium Development Goals. And we realize that it is driven to a large extent by, by tradition, by economic factors, and by the fact that, that women and girls have such an inferior status in the communities where this happens. Religion is not a driving factor. It's interesting, child marriage happens not only across many countries, 
but also across many religions. Yet there is not one religion that says marry your girls before they're 18 years old. But unfortunately, very often religious leaders, either they actually perform the act of marriage, or they're at least not speaking out forcefully against it. Um, and, and so one of the things the elders are also trying to do is reach out to, to religious leaders and say, come on, play your role, be a change maker, look at what you are doing. Um, now the reason, but I mean, I guess the reasons I gave you about the magnitude of the problem help explain why we find this so important. But I also think that it is because we realized if, if you or I would stand up about this and say, hey, this is wrong, People could easily say, who are you to stick your nose in our business? You're a cultural imperialist. Stay out of our traditions. We've been doing this for generation after generation. This is none of your business. Yet, if Archbishop Tutu and Grasso Michel and Kofi Annan and Cardoso and all these elders come and say, look, I'm sorry, we think there's something fundamentally flawed here. It's very hard to say, look, I'm sorry. We don't want to listen to, to this issue. So the elders figured we can help to give this issue the visibility that they think it deserves. And that's what we've been trying to work so hard on. And that's why we're so delighted that, that today also we're talking about this, about these 10 million invisible girls to help them get the, the visibility they deserve. Thank you, Mabel. I'm just, I'm now going to move over to Tony and talk about the other piece of this commoditization uh, crisis, which is actually child trafficking. And uh, Tony, I'd like to ask you just to, you know, frame this issue for us a bit and talk to us a bit about how you got involved and about what your organization does. How much time do I have? <laughs> as long as Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Um, the subject of sex trafficking uh, whether it be trafficking in general or sex trafficking of children, um, is a broad subject. And one of the most, the biggest problems we are facing is that it's such a taboo subject. Now I can literally sit here and talk to you for ages about it. And uh, I have a speech prepared on it, but I, I don't even have to look at that because it is so prevalent in our society. Slowly, it is slowly coming out. People are being more responsibility when it comes to media, agencies or governments are starting to talk about it a little more, but not enough because it's a $32 billion industry. Can you quantify that in your heads, how much $32 billion is? It's more than the joint revenue of General Motors, General Electric, Yahoo, all of them put together. If sex trafficking or trafficking in general was a corporation, it would be the top of the Fortune 500 list. So that's what we're up against. I've, um, I came to, uh, to this cause uh, via a wonderful man named Sheriff Mike Brown, who was instrumental in starting a federal task force in the US. I was on my way to Iraq, and I met him at Dulles Airport. He told me about sex trafficking of children. He told me about pedophiles on the internet. I, like most people, knew nothing about it, very little about it. I promised him that when I come back to the US, I'll go to Virginia and meet with him and he can talk to me about it. He wanted to talk to me because I come from law enforcement. I come from a military background. And he thought maybe I'd be interested in this cause. So I went and saw him in Virginia. What he showed me was so shocking that I can't repeat it because you'd have nightmares tonight. It was that bad. And it made me look at humankind, my fellow man, and go, what has happened to us? When you're talking about sex trafficking of children, four words. You take sex and trafficking, or sex and children, these are all in the same sentence. How did this happen? when it's a 28 million, 28 billion dollars of that 32 billion is because of commercial sex exploitation. It's prevalent in 161 countries. The problem is not that people seem to think this happens in Ukraine, Russia, Eastern Bloc, or in Asia, Cambodia, Thailand. 
Well, maybe in the Middle East, maybe Qatar or Kuwait. It does happen there, but it happens here. It happens in Paris. Paris is a destination city for trafficking from Africa, Europe, Asia. It happens in the US. When you look at the internet, for example, the internet's amazing. It's, it's joined the world, right? We're all talking on Facebook and whatever chat rooms. It's connected the world. It's put presidents or helped put presidents in power. Now, recently, it's toppled uh, dictatorships. We've seen it recently on the news, right? Social networking. But it's given the bad guys a whole new platform. It's given child pedophiles a whole new hunting ground. Here's a statistic for you. And this is from the FBI. An unsuspecting child on the internet stands a 100% chance that they're going to be approached by a predator. So you're on that social networking site or chat room, some or other time, a predator is going to approach you. They're going to pose as this 14-year-old girl or 14-year-old boy, and you think you're talking to someone of that age. Imagine you're 13, 14, talking to a predator. I've done that before. We go online, we go undercover online. The federal task force is called ICAC, Internet Crimes Against Children. So we go in a chat room and we pose as 14-year-old boy or girl. Hi, my name's Mary, I like playing basketball, right? Last time I did that, within a minute, I had eight hits. They know I'm a 14-year-old girl, or well, they suspect that, okay? That instance, we arrested a man in a different state who is 60 years old. And the conversation revealed that it wasn't just him soliciting us for sex. There's even an element of bestiality to that. It's become a really sick world. Um, this, there's so much to talk about on the subject that just tell me to keep quiet when you've had enough. <laughs> you know, I've, I've made mistakes. I, um, for example, the Haiti quake, the earthquake. Remember? Um, I actually want to read to you an extract. There was an email that was sent to me. And it's pretty shocking, and that's why I want to read it to you. This was sent to me about two weeks before the quake, right? Hi, Tony. I am connected to the chief, the chief justice of Hades, equivalent to the Supreme Court. I'm a member of parliament. I um, have relationships with chief of police and several judges. I thought I'd reach out to you about people setting up orphanages and using them for child sex exploitation. In Haiti, there's a problem with people setting up orphanages. They are Americans and Canadians who are pedophiles. They then use the children in the orphanages for their purposes. A couple of years ago, I tried to see if there was any way that anything could be done through the US or Canadian embassies, but was told that there was nothing they could do about this kind of thing. Please help, sincerely. Okay, think about that. So now you're an orphan. You've been dealt a really bad hand in life, right? You have no parents. Now, you're being sexually exploited. You've been taken and raped eight times a day, every day, until you can't anymore. What happens then? Can you imagine? Right? Now, this is an email I received probably two weeks before the Haiti quake. Embarrassingly, from, on my behalf, I thought, wow, quake, horrible. The last thing I thought about was trafficking. But this is what we're dealing with. The traffickers in Haiti were driving around in trucks, right, flatbed trucks, standing on the bed of the truck, and calling orphaned or homeless children at the prospect of getting food and fresh water. And what happened? They were trafficked. Used as sex slaves, had false adoption papers for trafficking outside of Haiti. All this while everyone around them is searching for someone who's still breathing under all this rubble. So this is the sickness we are dealing with. 
Again, 28 billion of that 32 billion of trafficking is from commercial sex exploitation. It is and has become the number one most lucrative criminal enterprise. Criminals are, are entrepreneurs. Criminals go where the money is. They don't care whether it's sex exploitation of children or it's drugs. They're making money. This filters down again into economic problems. Economic problems seem to, you know, be the crux of most of the evils because that's when people are desperate. And that's when the weak can be preyed upon. Now, I'm going to rest my case right there for, we'll come back to the Q&As and then you can, uh, you can hammer me with questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay, where to begin? I'm sure you have a lot of questions, uh, as do I. I'd like to start, first of all, I think I'll just take it from where Tony was talking about the economic problems that actually give rise to so much of this. And uh, Mabel, there was some discussion, of course, uh, we had a discussion about this, and, and the elders speak about this, about this, you know, child marriage is a problem of human rights and of economics. And uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the, both of those elements, both those sides of the issue. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the development challenges that arise from child marriage. And um, you know, what, how can we address those? Well, um, there are two sets, I think, of economic issues related to child marriage. One is families who marry their girls out because, because of economic implications. And that varies from in, I mean, it has to be said that child marriage happens primarily in very poor rural settings. I mean, I've been to places where they don't even have television, let alone radio. So um, that's not the only place where it happens, but it doesn't normally happen in, in, in rich cities, etc. cetera. Um, what you see often is it can mean just having one less mouth to feed by marrying the girl out. Um, it can be that you do it, like for example in India, the longer you wait, the higher the dowry, the price you have to pay. So you want to get rid of the girls before, before you have to pay a much higher price. Um, in, in the case of in, in several communities in Africa, it's actually the other way around. When you marry your daughter out, you get, you get money or you get cows or, or cattle or what have you. So, you know, in order to survive, you might want to do that. So there is on that micro level the issue. But on the other side, there is the, the issue to which I made some reference earlier, which is girls who are, who are pulled out of school in order to get married will never make the economic contributions that, that they could make to their families and to their communities. Um, because, because they just don't have the education levels that they can be more productive. Um, but it's not just economic reasons that, that make this happen. And, and I've been thinking about this. I mean, at some point I was in Ethiopia and I met this girl and, and I asked her, how old were you when you got married? And she looked at me and she said, I'm sick. I was six. And I have a daughter who's six years old. And so I'm sitting there and, and I've been thinking a lot about this. Like, what would it take for me to marry my six-year-old daughter out? And I'm convinced that every parent in the world wants the best for their children. So what would it take that if I was a parent in Senegal or in, in rural Nigeria or in Bangladesh or, or in Nicaragua, that I think that it is actually in the best interest of my girl that I marry her out, whether as extremely as six years old, but you know, even 13, 14, 15 years old. And, and I think there are three reasons. I mean, one is this issue of, in many places, daughters are just not valued the same way as sons. I mean, when I was in India a few weeks ago, people kept telling me, daughters are a burden. The second reason, and I think that's something we collectively need to change, and where not only the elders can play a role, but everybody of us here in this room can play a role. The second thing is this issue of economics. That is a driver, and sometimes security has to do with it. But most importantly, and that's where the taboo again comes in, similarly to trafficking, it's a traditional issue. 
People do it because that's the way how things have been done for ages and ages and ages. And imagine that we are all living in the same village. And you don't want your daughter to get married at the age of nine. And we find out, and we all look at you, and we're like, what's wrong with your daughter? And what's wrong with you, Jessinder? Why are you disobeying the rules of our village? And so we might isolate you, and your daughter might then never get married. So there's an enormous peer pressure for you to make sure that your daughter gets married at the age of nine. And so the question is, how do you break that? And the interesting thing is that change is possible. Because we've seen villages, still far too few, but for example, in, in Western Africa, there's now a program where 5,000 villages have collectively decided to abandon female genital mutilation, you know, female cutting, as well as child marriage. Because through dialogue, they came to realize, like, why are there so many girls in our village that die at such a young age when they're giving birth? How come we're still so poor? How come we have so many kids? How, how come there's no proper family planning? And it wasn't because, you know, there were, you know, Westerners coming saying, hey, this is wrong, you guys need to change it. But there was a dialogue where the elders of the village, you know, the religious leaders, the traditional leaders, in, in many cases, luckily also the women, came together and realized this is actually not in our own best interest. We need to collectively change that practice. And that kind of idea of social norm change that Grasse Michelle was talking about in the film is so possible because she's so right. Traditions are man-made, man -made, so people can actually change them. But it requires a collective commitment to do that rather than Jess Finder on her own saying, I'm just going to change this. And that's what's so interesting about change making, that we have to do it together. Thank you, Mabel. Jess Vinder, I'm going to ask you, um, and, I, and Mabel has touched on this a bit. I mean, there are now laws in many countries. When you read about the issue of child marriage, um, you, you get the sense that there is some progress in, in eliminating child marriage, or at least dealing with the issues. And I'd like to ask you, I mean, you were in, in the UK when this happened to you. And I mean, that, that is a frightening thought. Uh, there laws obviously don't actually make a difference. Policy is not what will make this change. And so I wonder as we sit here with uh, future leaders of, uh, of 20 different nations, if you could maybe talk to the girls a little bit about what they can do, what you think very specifically can be done, or what their government should be doing. I mean, outside of, outside of laws, obviously, because this exists in many places outside of the legal sphere. I think the first thing that one has to recognize is that within those communities where the significant issues are happening is there is a law, it's an unwritten code of conduct within those communities. And it, it's important to understand that because as you grow up, you have to abide by that law in the family, the rules of engagement. I think personally, you could never ever change my family's mindset by educating them, sad to say. I'm not saying one shouldn't educate communities because they should, but I can tell you this, that my sisters are now doing the same to their children as what my family did to me. And these are British born subjects. So we've got to actually acknowledge what the reality is here. And that is that many younger generations are perpetuating the abuse very often become the gatekeepers to their sister's honor, is it? It's a word that we learn when we're very young. So I personally believe, and as a campaigner, what I don't very often see is those in privileged positions within their families, and what for me is a privilege is to have a family, is to have loving parents, is to have a wider community network that actually supports you what I don't very often hear is their voices speaking out against this. And the same can be said for people in power, I have to say. Laws maybe don't change hearts and minds, but what they do do is send out a very strong message. In the UK, we don't have specific criminal legislation designed to deal with forced marriages. And our government deal with around five and a half thousand cases a year. We repatriate 
up to 480 British subjects every year as young as eight years old who've been forced into marriage or at risk of forced marriage. At my charity, Karma Nirvana, we have a national helpline in the UK and we're currently dealing with 500 calls a month on the helpline. And I can tell you, in 2008, we had for the first time in England and Wales, and now in Scotland too, the Forced Marriage Act, which is civil law designed to protect the most vulnerable or those at risk of forced marriage. And since 2008 to date, we have seen issued over 250 forced marriage protection orders to protect people at risk of forced marriage or who've been forced into marriage. The important thing to note there is that more than 50% of those have been issued to protect people under the age of 16. So laws do help, and I do also feel that countries should consider laws to send out a strong message to those perpetrators who are doing this to the victims. But I, I really feel that, especially you here, the 20 here, I'm sure you have the love and support of your families, it's important that young people in those positions are taking a stand and speaking out this and getting their families to engage and getting wider community members to engage too. For me, you know, that is really important because I have to say, as a campaigner who is not part of that community anymore, my community was an Asian Sikh community and they have totally ostracized me because of what I stand for. Sadly, I don't have the power to affect change in that community anymore because they don't accept me in that community. But I know there are many people in those communities and other communities who have that power. And sadly, I don't meet many of them. So we need to find them and get them to engage. Thank you. Tony, um, the enormity of the problem that you talk about is almost unimaginable. And um, I'd like to ask you, similarly, what resources are required? Uh, when you think about a $32 billion industry, I mean, that is just absolutely enormous. What, what resources are required? How do we actually address this problem? And where do we start? It just seems almost impossible. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an enormous problem, meaning that it needs various ways. Well, it needs not various, it needs every possible way that we have to combat this, whether it be law, Law is very important, and often I'm shocked by legislation. Um, President Bush passed a law, I think it was the 2003 Protection Act, I stand corrected, but that is if any U.S. citizen commits a crime on foreign soil, I mean sexually related to children, where they are returned to the U.S., that's life imprisonment, right? That's a sexually related crime on children. That same crime within U.S. borders, two to five years. How does that work? So legislations being one of them. Yeah, you need people out there campaigning for that. One organization, one NGO or IGO or politician can't do it, right? You need as many as possible. When it comes to the media, Awareness is our biggest weapon. Absolutely. Breaking the taboo, actually talking about fellow men sexually exploiting children. That is possible. And that it happens. And how big it is. So media is a weapon for us. For example, only recently have we started partnering with bigger Hollywood or media companies. A weapon that we devised, and it is a weapon, the awareness weapon, for example, is a festival. We're having a PSA festival, public service announcements. Again, in the US, they're, they're prevalent. They're one minute adverts educating the public on certain dangers, right? So now we have film schools from around the world sending us PSAs that will be judged by, you know, Hollywood heavyweights. Right? DreamWorks is, for example, one of the hosts of the festival. So now we get all these PSAs and we blast the internet, we blast the media with that. Why? Because awareness is our weapon. So legally, you need to, we need change. Awareness from every way possible. 
whether it be chatting to communities, whether it be chatting to friends, whether it be touring groups that go to schools and educate on sex trafficking and the pitfalls of the internet. We work with the Safe Surfing Foundation. That's education software. Now you guys know, you go to school, you get given when you were younger, 15, 16 years old. I don't know, how old are you anyway? Okay, okay when you're slightly younger at school and you get education software, are you going to watch it? No. So you need a mandatory policy for education at schools, right? We provide education software for free through the Safe Surfing Foundation. So it's a multi-tiered strategy that doesn't just end with what I'm saying, but it's your generation, right? You are the internet information age generation. It's up to you to devise better methods because we're always behind. We're trying to catch up to them. Think about it. If it's a $32 billion industry, you think they don't have the money for the best equipment, the best software, the best strategies? If it's such a big industry, you better believe it that the biggest crime syndicates in the world are on, on top of this because they're earning the most money. So we're always trying to catch up to them, even on the internet. So, again, it falls back into your lap. You girls need to figure this out. We're doing, and I feel old already because I don't understand the internet as much as you do and software and computers. I, I mean, it's, that's how rapid technology has, has, has become. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I wrote at school. I think, you know, I didn't have computers. I'm not that old. Right? So, <laughs> again, it, it falls back on you. So that's the reason you're here, and that's the reason we're here. Okay, we're preaching, preaching, but we're hoping that you grab hold of it and go, wow, this is so bad. I have a social responsibility to devise something to combat this.